Welcome to our continuing series, WCBS Author Talks. I'm Marla Diamond. I'm here today with Brad Thor. He is the author of Use of Force, his latest thriller, and uh, that is on bookshelves today. You're a Correct. New York Times best-selling author. This is the 17th in a series about uh, a guy that I'm wondering if he's your alter ego, <laughs> Scott Horvath. He keeps coming back for more. He does, and, and he is my alter ego. The same way I think that James Bond was for Ian Fleming and Jack Ryan was for Tom Clancy, he gets to run around and do all the stuff that my wife won't let me do. He does a lot of dangerous stuff as a uh, covert uh, op and mm -hmm. uh, for, former Navy SEAL. He's a contractor for the government um, doing... Uh, missions that I suppose the government doesn't want its fingerprints on, correct? Absolutely. So he's, uh, particularly in use of force, he's on a black contract. And I call what I do faction, where you don't know where the facts end and the fiction begins. And uh, with use of force, I actually based the book off a real-life news story, which was a laptop when a raid happened on a terrorist safe house overseas. A laptop was found. And they looked at it, it looked like it had just come out of Best Buy, but when they fired it up, it was just clean, there was nothing on it. They drilled down deeper and found all these terrible terrorist plots, plots to hit New York, Atlanta, Chicago, San Francisco, and spots in Europe. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting? They never caught the guy that put the laptop together. The CIA has been looking for him for years. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to have a book that kicks off with that guy's body washing ashore in the Mediterranean, in Italy, actually. And then alarm bells go off in the CIA, and they're wondering, is this guy connected to the big attacks we've been hearing threatened all summer? And so that's the faction part where my fiction jumps off for this book. So it starts with uh, a shipwreck sort mm -hmm. of uh, off the... Uh uh, Adriatic Sea in Italy or... Yeah, it, actually Italy? close to... The, okay. it's, it's the refugee route where the smugglers take a lot of the refugees from North Africa and try to get them to Sicily. Uh, in researching the book, I found all of these connections between ISIS and the mafia in Italy. It's fascinating, fascinating stuff. Right, so you touch upon the current refugee crisis, mm -hmm. getting into the terror plot. Tell us a little bit about this uh, plot, which takes us from the Burning Man Festival mm -hmm. to Italy, to Syria, to uh, areas, uh, Libya, excuse me, to Libya, talks about the, uh, the, the Syria crisis. Um, you obviously use uh, real, you said you use reality, you mix it with fiction. Tell us a little bit about this uh, terror plot and uh, what Horvath is uh, trying to combat this time around. Well, so I've been fascinated. The Burning Man looks like a great thing. So that's another thing I haven't been able to do. I mean, it's it looks like a pretty wild, wild uh, place, but it is a perfect terrorist target. Yeah. And uh, what, what astounded me in my research is, Last Burning Man, there were like a thousand children there under 12 years of age. Mm. I mean, people are taking their kids to this big thing, and Burning Man looks like a lot of fun. Uh, the way the environment's set up, where it's kind of there's no cash, it's a very communal, non judgmental, and masks and costumes, it's a perfect place for terrorists to get in and hide and commit some pretty bad acts. And you've got the kind of the titans of the tech world that go to Burning Man, too, where they have these turnkey camps where they show mm -hmm. helicopters land and they jump out. And there's uh, some of the burners don't like that. that the they man, don't. The mansion tents? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, I thought, wouldn't that be. I'm very cinematic when I write my thrillers. I've got short cinematic chapters, but I'm always picturing what will the movie look like. Right. And so just the colorful, out in the middle of this flat desert lake bed, I thought would be really cool to start off and have an attack. So it opens with that refugee boat sinking, the guy's body washes ashore, and then there's an attack at Burning Man, and that kicks everything off. But the main way that I have the terrorists conducting their attacks going forward from Burning Man, there's one particular attack that's kind of the climax of the book. That's the one that everybody, all the intelligence agencies are worried about because the minute that attack starts, even if they realize it started, they can't stop it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the secret, you know, surprise right at the end of the book that I won't spoil. But that is the one, one of the ones next to a nuke, this is the other one that they are absolutely terrified about. Right. Your, your book just l lacks excitement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my job. You I mean, want to just, uh, I'm not going to turn like the page. It's like every chapter has some crazy, you know, killing, interrogation. Um, how, how, how real is that? I mean, do you know what goes on um, behind the scenes sort of in the government? You, you don't have experience with the CIA. You were no, not no, no, no. A, you were not a Navy SEAL. No, no. 
my dad's a Marine and my, my uncle slash kind of godfather was a special agent in charge of the FBI field office in Newark. Uh, and so I've, I've got a lot of great relationships, friends who are SEALs. Uh, I thank a few of them in the back of the book. So I'll talk to them about how things happen. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain catharsis that happens when you read a thriller like mine. You want to see this. I let people walk right up to the line and peer into that world. You get to see what CIA operatives are doing overseas, what Navy SEALs are doing, Delta, Delta Force operatives. And I also play a little bit with, okay, if these are the rules, and we're a nation of laws, not of men, uh, are there any points at which we should consider breaking some of our own rules if we're fighting an enemy that doesn't have a rule book? So there's a lot of that stuff. It's, again, great beat tree, toes in the sand, book in the hand kind of thing. You can skim across the top of the waves, but then there's there's deeper subtext there in things like that. So the book kind of operates on, on two levels. Right. And um, fact and fiction. So I'm thinking that the government must be reading this to see what the potential plots could be. I mean, are you involved in any way in aiding the government to sort of imagine what could be? Yes. After 9-11, when the Department of Homeland Security got put together, they created a program called the Analytic Red Cell Unit. And the idea was, this was before the 9-11 Commission report came out, saying that 9-11 had happened because of a failure of imagination on our part. That was one of the big findings. So even before the Commission got together, the federal government was saying, we need to outthink the bad guys. Mm -hmm. And we have a problem in D.C. where we keep thinking the same way. And a big problem that, there's a lot of creative people in the federal government, but the government in general kind of looks backwards. It's like fighting in your rear view mirror, expecting to fight the last fight you had. Um, and what they did was, and not everybody's that way, but there is that kind of calcification that exists. So they put together the Red Cell program and said, let's bring in people from outside D.C., creative thinkers. So people like me, Michael Bay, who directed the Transformer movies, and they brought us in and they said, okay, if you were in this scenario or you had access to this type of a thing, and we're all looking at each other going, are they actually feeding us real, like, slivers of intelligence, wondering how, uh, like, for example, there was one terror attack that I was concerned about. I said, I really see this happening in a big city, something like this. And um, it got worked up, and then it actually took place overseas. And I called my guy uh, in the program at DHS, and I said, you know, this is all over the news that this just happened. Can I talk about this publicly and say, we developed this in there, and this is something we're on the lookout for here? And he said, no. So he said, we don't talk about anything there. And so I refer to it as the government, or the Las Vegas of government programs. What happens in the red cell <laughs> stays there. I use my creative energy the way I do for my books for the government, but I can't take any of that and put it into my books. Right. Yeah. I, I would want to say you have a wild sense of imagination, but this stuff is so realistic, it's scary. It, it happens. And I think, I, again, that catharsis, I kind of got ahead of myself where I said you can see into these worlds with my books, but you can see the threats and see how we all hope they would be handled, right? Uh, so we hope that things would work out the way they do in the book, but in this book, what I tried to do, I'm a big fan of the series uh, Ray Donovan. I love watching Ray Donovan with Leif Schreiber, and I know John Voight, and John Voight, actually, that's why I started watching, because John is a fan of my books. And um, I love the fact that nothing ever seems to go right for Ray Donovan. And I kind of broke that down last year as I was putting this book together, going, why do I love Ray Donovan so much? And I realized you know, he's a likable character, he's got a likable family, he doesn't necessarily do good things, does what he has to do, but it never seems to break his way. Mm -hmm. But he always figures out a way out of it. Right. That inspired me to raise the bar even further with this book to really make sure that nobody caught a break here. Okay. That every time you thought it couldn't get worse, it does get worse. <laughs> and I talked to a lot of my spy buddies and SEAL buddies and say, what would you do in that situation? And they said, you know, sometimes you do a lot of soul searching. Sometimes you have to decide, do I cut a corner here? And do I suffer the consequences potentially later? I mean, what's going to get me to success? That's one of the things that I respect about the SEALs so much in particular is their slogan is, failure is not an option. And the only easy day was yesterday, the one you lived through. Mm -hmm. That's the only easy day you're ever going to see. Right. So it helps me elevate my game. Okay, so you're an author but a pretty political guy. And one of your books really uh, 
angered the Islamic fundamentalists and you ended up on a hit list. So tell us about that. Uh, so I did a I did a book that actually uh, Glenn Beck had called it the Da Vinci Code of Islam. Right. My book was The Last Patriot. Um, I went to I went to the University of Southern California. I had a lot of Muslim friends there. So we had a lot of people whose families had fled the the uh, collapse of the Shah in Iran, so we had a lot of Persian kids at my school, we had kids from Saudi Arabia, and I was fascinated by how such a, an enormous group of people in a religion could, the majority of people, over 90%, could read these texts and have Jews and Christians as their neighbors, live in communities where they cared about the school system, they wanted what was best, they wanted a better future for their kids, and then you could have a very small sliver of a particular religion, religion read the text in a completely different way. So I've been interested in Islam, uh, for a long time, and one of the things that I discovered as I was studying Islam was that later in the prophethood of Muhammad, his revelations were contradicting each other, and this posed a problem for his apostles. And they came to him and they said, if Allah is perfect and he's revealing these things through the angel Gabriel to you, how can they be contradictory? Created a problem for him. He went away for a few days, came back, and had this concept of what's called abrogation, which means if I deliver a revelation to you today and it contradicts, contradicts something from before, then what I give you today abrogates that. It wipes that out. So what I thought would be interesting for a thriller is there was a discovery in, in Yemen at, the, at a mosque in Yemen of all these old Qurans. And the, uh, the Yemeni government brought in, this was real life, German scientists to date it. And they said, oh my gosh, there's actually stuff here that didn't make it into the Quran. And the Yemeni shut the, shut the, uh, the research down. So this concept of abrogation, I thought, wouldn't it be a cool thriller if Muhammad had one final revelation before he died? And there's this kind of Indiana Jones thing and everybody wants to get to it and who's fighting to keep it hidden? And I thought this would be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a certain group, Islamic fundamentalists, didn't like that I was even suggesting in fiction. We can, we can fictionalize Buddhism, you can go after Catholicism, sure. you can go after Judaism, but there is a very small sliver of Islam that wants a protected space mm -hmm. where nothing is questioned. And so when I fictionalized this, I had a great pro-Muslim character, a good Muslim character in there. And so while, yes, I did, the book got banned in Saudi Arabia, I got a ton of death threats, but I also heard from a lot of Muslim people that said, you know what, we liked this book, mm -hmm. and we liked the character that you did, and thank you for not making all the bad guys Muslim. Thank you for making that one character that was a prime character in that such a good person who cared about their colleagues at the FBI and all this stuff. So it was kind of a interesting, you don't like the death threats, but you know, that's Twitter and Facebook, that stuff, YouTube, even in the comments right. section, it, it exists. Right, right. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about your views on our current president, also the, your views on the policies of the Obama administration um, in these countries that harbored terrorists, Pakistan being one example. Um, do you support one over the other in terms of, you know, going after these cells, finding these 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 bad guys that you portray in the book, um, does this current administration, are they on the right track? Well, uh, I'll tell you, I'm a, so where I stand politically is I don't care if an idea comes from Chuck Schumer or Mitch McConnell, Nancy Pelosi or, or, uh, or, or, or Ryan, I, I don't. What matters to me is, is this going to give me more freedom or less freedom. I'm a real big believer that if I can make choices that are right for me and my family and my community, the school district, that we actually will come to better solutions than if they get pushed down from Washington. I always, I, I, we're always going to have people among us who are, you know, quadriplegic or uh, may lose a job. I want to, I want to help the people in my community, and I, I don't want Washington to be a behemoth that dictates to me because they don't know what's right for me and my community. Uh, they certainly don't know what's right for somebody and other. It's, so that's that's where I come from. From just kind of a, I'm a very small government guy, very conservatarian, if you will, real strong libertarian streak. I believe that we need to be really tough on Islamic fundamentalism. And yet, while I like going after them, that's not gonna fix the problem. Mm -hmm. It's like whack-a-mole. Because if we don't get to the root of the ideology, and what I think we should be doing is, we see this stuff, so the attacks in London, in Manchester, yes. in Paris, there's been a machete attack at the Louvre, there was a hammer attack at Notre Dame. I think what we should be doing, particularly when you look at like the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, mm -hmm. where we hear, yeah, the guy was on the FBI's radar. Right. 
But we are people that believe in the rule of law here. So you can't just say because that person's Muslim, we're going to round them up. But I do believe that there's on-ramps to jihadism. And just like child pornography, if you're searching child pornography on the Internet, we're sending you to jail. Right. And I think that, as I've talked to Muslim people, that they don't support the, the beheading videos, uh, the terrible videos that ISIS cranks out. They don't support the hate sermons that call for the killing of Jews and non-Muslims like uh, al-Waqi, uh, who's now deceased. So I think we can actually lower the prosecutorial bar, make it easier to prosecute people earlier in the process. Uh, the FBI is overwhelmed. Every intelligence service in the Western world is overwhelmed. We have too many potential jihadists, and they can't watch all of them. Yeah. So what I think we should do is that there should be a very heavy price to pay for even dipping your toe into the jihadist waters. Again, I think it should be treated like child pornography. Right. We should say, if you're caught involved with this, you're going to jail right. for a minimum of 10 years. So how, how effective, but yesterday the, the Supreme Court decided that they will hear um, arguments on Trump's travel ban. How effective do you think that that is? Well, so here's what I think, this is my problem with the Trump administration, okay? I was not a Trump guy. I worked on Rick Perry's campaign. Uh, and I, I understand, and now I'm in New York, and he's a pugnacious kind of Queens guy, and, and that's his style, which may be great in a reality television world in the rough and tumble of real estate in New York, but he's the leader of the free world now, and I think he should rise to the office instead of pulling the office down to his level, but he's 71 years old, so I don't know what you're gonna see. I think the biggest mistake that they've had in this administration is a lousy communications plan because what they put out is a travel ban, and he brags that it's a travel ban. The list of the six countries that they originally had on that list were ones that were developed, and rightly so, by the Obama administration because those countries couldn't even tell you if the guy getting on the airplane had an overdue library book or a parking ticket. Mm -hmm. There's no way to vet these people. And I think a lot of Americans don't realize that when you hop on the airplane in Paris or London to come back to the United States, back to New York, your name is fed into a computer. Right. We know who's getting on airplanes coming to this country. So the idea that these uh, these countries that were predominantly Muslim countries, that, that they couldn't tell us if bad guys were getting on the airplanes, why couldn't the Trump administration come out and actually praise the Obama administration? You know, and say, this, the Obama administration identified six countries that really have a hard time knowing who's bad and who's good, and we want to work and help those countries to better their systems of vetting before people get on airplanes. We want them to be on the level of the airport in Rome or the airport in Dublin and things like that. So I think they could have achieved the same thing, but it's like they think they're the first people to ever go to Washington, and they're going to break all the yeah. China. And, before you break the rules, you have to know what the rules are and which ones should be broken. So that that's my issue. I think that they could do a lot more to better communicate because as you and I talked off camera, I think there's more that unites us than divides us. Mm -hmm. But if we're only focusing on the divisive stuff, this toxic culture isn't going to get better. And I don't want another 9-11 to bring us all together. I really don't. I want my kids, we were talking about the fact that I grew up in the 80s. It was fantastic. So did I. The, the, the economy I the was booming. Was bad, but. The hair was bad, but the fashion was fun and the music was fun. <laughs> and I'd like for our kids to experience that kind of optimism and excitement and positivity that we had in the 80s. I'd love to have that happen now. And I'd love for, for there to be so many jobs in this country that people can turn them down. And so wages go up because there's so much competition for workers and we don't have to worry about you know making sure everybody has a job because the economy's booming and that'll take care of itself so that's what I'd like to see that'd be my hope okay so we have just about a minute left to uh, wrap this Thanks. up and uh, you, you've written 17 books about I have. Scott Horvath does he have more does he have more adventures ahead I, I, absolutely and I've, I've developed some new characters that I'm starting to bring up kind of a farm team kind of a bullpen situation where I'm bringing them in this I get to do what I love for a living it's so much fun and this is the best part of my job because I get to go out on tour and meet the readers and they're the ones that make my career possible right. those are the people it's my job review now mm -hmm. I get to see the people I work for thank them and say what do you want to see more of right and uh, we could pick this up and uh, not have to kind of figure out his past. A every book is meant to stand alone. So you don't need to have ever read a Brad Thor book before you can start with Use of Force. Okay. And um, maybe you get to live out some of the stuff. The, the, uh, the scenes in uh, Italy and uh, the, the, uh, in Europe are so beautiful. I have to believe that you've written about your vacations or something like that. I traveled a little and the Rome bureau chief for the Daily Beast, I reached out to her on Twitter because I'd read so many of her articles about ISIS and the mafia and all this stuff. 
the loveliest woman in the world, and I give her two big shout outs at the back of the book because you can't write what I write without the help of other people. So I'm very fortunate that such kind people have helped me. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a book, uh, a beach read, as you said, yep. but, you know, sort of a tourism guide to Europe, and so enjoyable. And thanks so much for joining My us pleasure. on WCBS Author Talks. Brad Thor, Use of Force, the book is out today.